Genesis chapter 2, we'll read from verse 24 and 25. Genesis chapter 2, from verse 24 and 25. Can you help me ask your neighbor one more time, how are you doing? I hope you are coping well in Lagos. <laughs> Praise God. Genesis chapter 2, from verse 24 and 25. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Translation. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife. They shall become one flesh. Somebody say one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. I'd love to read this verse one more time uh, uh, from this Amplified Classic Translation. One more time, just for the uh, purpose of emphasizing this verse this morning. It said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. His father and his mother. Ancestry and familiarity. He said, a man shall leave his father and his mother. When you read father and mother, you're talking about parents, you're talking about ancestry, you're talking about background, you're talking about familiarity, you're talking about fa- familiar, anything that is, you know, that we're, we're really familiar with or used to. He said, if a man shall leave his father and mother and become united and clean to his wife, and they shall both become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed or ashamed. (laughs) Were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. This morning, I'm speaking. Praise God. All right, I think we'll have some peculiar technical issues this morning, and I'm sure they're fixing it. Uh, try as much as possible not to be embarrassed. <laughs> and we'll be okay. All right. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. But I know I trust my guys are going to sort this out. It's just a little glitch. Okay? I'm speaking this morning on what I've titled, Leave So You Can Cleave. Can you hear me tell your neighbor, say, Leave So You Can Cleave. Leave so you can cleave. All right. Last Sunday, we spoke about, about the fact that leaving and cleaving is not an event, it's a process. Now, I can't remember whether it was in this service or in the, or in the married people's service. I think it was a married people's service. In this service. Married people service that I that I <laughs> that I thought touched on that a little bit. That leaving and cleaving is a process, not an event. When two people come to the altar and they're being joined together in holy matrimony, uh, you know, just like the King James version or the New King James version of that scripture says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Uh, and uh, the two of them shall become one flesh. When we join two people together, most of the time, we feel like now we have been joined. So we are now man and wife. You know, like when I conduct weddings, I'll I'll now say something like, ladies and gentlemen, men and brethren. (laughs) Uh, It's my singular honor to present to you the latest couple in the universe, Mr. and Mrs. ABC. And uh, everybody will clap. And we say things like, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. You know, and all the rhymes. But this is where I'm going this morning. Living and cleaving is not an event that happens at the altar. It's a process. What we do when we conduct wedding ceremonies is that we signal a new beginning, a journey into cleaving. A journey into cleaving. It's like two people who have a destination. You want to go from the city of Lagos uh, to the nearest biggest city in the southwest here, Ibadan, which is just like 120 kilometers uh, from Lagos. When you are departing and we are waving you bye-bye, 
what we are doing is not celebrating your getting to Ibadan. We are celebrating your departure. Am I saying the truth? But we know that if you remain on a particular path, you're going to get to that city successfully. Am I saying the truth? Many people misconstrue, you know, uh, uh, and they have this ideology that the moment you get married, you're just going to cleave. You know, we're like, uh, they say five and six, or something like that, or it's six and nine, or let me not mess it up. Yeah. Help me, what, what, what do we call it? Five and six. Just like, I don't think five and six, actually. <laughs> That's what was confusing me. <laughs> so, but you know, we have all those saints. We say, oh, we click, we click. And many singles have this mind also that when you are dating somebody, you went on your first date or your second date, and you say, oh, what food do you like to eat? The person says, oh, I love spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> and you say, oh, pasta. I love pasta too, you know. And then, um, we, you know, you say, oh, what kind of dessert do you like? I, I, I love sponge cake. You say, oh, I'm, I'm a sweet too, too. I love cake. And then you get back to your friends and say, oh, we, 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 we just click. <laughs> yeah. We seem to just like the same things. Yeah. You ask about the movie. What kind of movie do you want? Do you love watching? You say, oh, rom-com, rom-com. You say, oh, I love that too. Yeah. So we are just like soulmates. <laughs> and you know, we said last Sunday also that soulmates is also not an event. It's a journey. Yeah. No two people become soulmates just because they met for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an event. It's a journey. So living and cleaving is a process, not an event. The journey uh, of becoming one takes time. And as singles, I want to admonish us this morning that that journey actually starts from where you are right now, which is preparing to leave. Because how you prepare to leave is how, what determines how well you will be able to cleave. How well you will be able to cleave. Many people want to get married but they have no process, nothing in place that is preparing them to leave. So living doesn't start at the altar. It starts when you, uh, when you start to take responsibility for your life as an adult. That's when it starts, when you start to take responsibility for your life as an adult. Are you preparing to leave? It's an important question I want to ask this morning. Are you preparing to leave? As you pray to God, about your marital destiny, about what is next for you, about your future, are you actually preparing for that future? Marriage, for the purpose of uh, this discussion, I would say is a relocation. And how well are you prepared to relocate? How well are you prepared to relocate? You know, for many people who make the most of their relocation endeavor, they prepare for years. For years. A few months ago, I was in Canada uh, speaking at the inaugural service, inauguration of our church in Canada, Elevate Community Church in the greater Toronto area. And I'm, after the service, I was interacting with um, a, a few of, of our members there, and people who are just joining for the first time. I think that service, uh, we had maybe about 150 adults or so in that service. And, you know, some of them waited behind, people who had known me before, obviously, and wanting to greet me and, 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 they started sharing testimonies. One guy walked up to me and said, oh, PG, thank you. Thank you for all your messages and all the good things that you do in our lives, blah, 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 blah. And he said, do you know my testimony? I came into this country, and in one week, I got a job of my dream. Yeah. Another lady spoke, told me that she got a job in two weeks. And these are multinational jobs. Now, you celebrate that as a miracle, right? But when we dug deeper into that conversation, I realized that they took their time to prepare for that relocation. They asked the right questions. How do you get the right job in Canada? Yeah. How do you settle fast? You know, they, they were talking to the right people. They joined the right WhatsApp group. Some people now, all the WhatsApp group you are in, there's none that's moving your life forward. <laughs> yeah. All of them is about gist, is about, you know, nothing that actually leads to practical progress or infusion of wisdom. 
It's only they tell you one gory story, post, send one picture, you know, that even WhatsApp is afraid to post to you. <laughs> you know, on Twitter these days, when, when there's a picture that is, they will give you the option first. They will warn you. Yeah, before you open it. Those are the things that some of us are doing. I mean, when these guys were sharing their testimony, I realized that they actually took their time to prepare for that relocation. Marriage, ladies and gentlemen, is a relocation. You're moving from where you used to be to where you want to be. And you need to prepare. There's a mental preparation. There's an emotional preparation. There's a spiritual preparation. There's a physical preparation that is required. If you will maximize that experience, if you truly want to leave and cleave, so when preparing for a journey, you know, you, you, you save up money, you, you pack, you, you, sometimes you have to dispose of certain assets if you're relocating. Especially if you're not, relocation means you're not coming back to where you used to be. Yeah. Some people prepare for marriage or refuse to prepare for marriage, got into marriage because in their mind they were already contemplating divorce and they're going to come back. Yeah. That life is going to deport them. Like they deport people who don't behave well abroad back to their home country. And that's why we're having much more divorce today. Because the forces that govern life will deport somebody who is not fit for a location back to the original location. Are you still with me today? I said, are you still with me today? Because, I mean, the truth is that uh, what, what you sow is what you reap. The proof of a tree is its fruit. The fruit that you are bearing is what shows us what kind of tree you are. I mean, if you got to a mango tree and you saw orange on it, will you take that orange? Eh? <laughs> no, it's true that will you take the orange? You got to a mango tree and I saw orange, Anki. You will now and start, you know, <laughs> eating it. Will you do that? No, you'll be afraid. And some people want, uh, you know, the way we view life is that we want to bear orange <laughs> fruit where we know that as we are right now, what, you're a mango tree. Yeah. What I mean is that you, you, you're not, Jesus said by their fruit, you shall know them. You're not preparing, you're not doing anything. Yeah. You left everything to chance. So we, you, you want to relocate, you may have to dispose of assets. What assets are you disposing of? Or what, what, what baggage do you have to throw away so you can get to where you want to go successfully? You know, when, when I travel, a lot of the time you get to border control in different countries. And um, when you get to custom and border control, they said, do you have anything to declare? If you have something to declare, you pass through a particular place. If you have nothing to declare, you pass through a particular place. If you have, if you check in any baggage, you go to baggage claim to first of all collect your bag. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I have many frequent trips and I just go and log in, travel light. Yeah, one dark jacket, one or two uh, pants, you know, and all that. Put everything together, quickly go, and come back. You don't want to go and claim any baggage. In life, <laughs> many people have too many baggage, and it creates problems. Yeah. Have you seen Nigerians at baggage claims? <laughs> at uh, at uh, Shippo in Amsterdam, or Muritala Mohammed, or Itro Airport in London? or at JFK in New York. They know Nigerians separately because of the way we pack. <laughs> Excess luggage, we call it. Somebody has two baggage allowance, and then you have four. Yeah. And then you pack everything, and you're struggling with it. That's where some people are right now. This message is to help you to declutter. Yeah. Somebody, as you're sitting down here right now, you want a new relationship, but the truth is that if you, if you just open up your heart, you have like five people there that are speaking to you from the different other relationships that you have had. Those, that's excess luggage. When somebody comes into your life and the person is speaking to you, you will be hearing him through the five, or you'll be hearing her through those five people. Yeah. The person says one thing, you interpret it in four ways. Let, let, me, let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So, um, a lady and a guy at dinner, they, they just started to date. And the guy was just talking about himself, talking about himself. As he's talking about himself, 
let's say the name of the lady is Janet and the guy is James. James is talking. Janet is interpreting what James is saying uh, from the point of view of Peter and from the point of view of Abdul. You understand? Uh -huh. Because this lady, she has dated across <laughs> and she has dated across econ uh, economic demographies. Yeah. So she has dated the poor and the rich, Hausa Muslim and Yoruba Christian. And <laughs> so you, you are hearing everything through different filters. Yeah. You're filtering everything in different ways. And then you say you couldn't make sense of the relationship. How will you make sense of the relationship? Because you, you have too many things that are speaking to you that you actually need to deal with. Can you let me ask your neighbor again, are you preparing to leave? So, really we should ask the question, what should follow you into marriage? And what do you need to leave behind? First Corinthians 13 and verse 11, Paul writes and he said, when I was a child, you know, I taught as a child, I reasoned as a child, and you know, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I taught as a child, but when I became a man, or I became mature, I put away childish things. Some of the baggage we're talking about today are born out of emotional childishness. We're not talking about age here right now. We're talking about emotional development. Yeah. Because when you say child, 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 they say, I'm not a child, I'm not a child. But some people were not in the service on Wednesday. Get the message of, of Wednesday. And we also distributed a questionnaire that you can use to grade where you are emotionally. So we said that are emotional infants, emotional uh, third children, emotional adolescents, and then emotional adults. And we distributed a questionnaire that people can just feel. It will grade you and will tell you whether you're an emotional infant. Yeah. Because it helps to put you together. And you can get the message, like I said, Pastor David was in the pastor of our Milan Center preached on Wednesday about it, and I really enjoy sitting down listening to him. So get the message, get that question here, feel it. Understand where you are. Some people are emotional children, and this childishness must not cross over with you into marriage. Praise God. So, Odin versus compulsive decluttering. My opinion, both of them are not good. What I mean is this. Some people just like to keep things. Why some people are throwing everything away? My wife and I were different in this. I am the type of person that feels I will still need it. I will still need it. Sometimes it works for me. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. This jacket I'm wearing this morning, um, I think I bought it like six years ago. Yeah. Um, someone like my wife, I'm not sure whether she has things that are six years old. Because, I, I'm, I'm not saying this in factual terms, I'm just saying I'm not sure. Because they like to unclutter. It's not like I like cluttering, it's just like I like certain things, I like keeping them. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife will not agree, she feels like I like just cluttering the whole place, yeah. I like giving things away, but it's just as there are some things you just feel like I'm not done. I still want this one. I want to hold it. Yeah. Two or three times a year, I, I pull, you know, I walk through my wardrobe and put things together and a lot of nice stuff. Some I've not even worn before and I decide to give them out. But yet, there will still be some things that will escape. Yeah. Based on just the feeling, emotional feeling that you have for those things. Some of us, some people here have, ladies, you have a bag. That bag is 20 years old. But you just love it. Yeah. So you just pack it and still put it in one place. Just clean it and put it there. Yeah. That's how, you see, this physical uh, um, example that I gave is how we behave emotionally about certain things. Yeah. So there was, there's this thing that hurt you 15 years ago. And then you just look at it and say, just, let's clean it up. It's nice. And put it there. So it's still part of your life. That's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, but preparing to leave will necessitate a, a very good audit of where you are emotionally. So that you are not overhauling 
things, and at the same time, it's not a compulsive decluttering. Because there are certain things you need to revisit and reevaluate and say, where are we here? Because we want to move forward and we need to decide whether this is going with us or not. Are you still with me right now? One definition of baggage is past experience or long held ideas that are considered burdens or impediments. Yeah. So that we're on the same page. I just wanted to understand this. Or past experience or long held idea that is considered a burden or impediment. That's what we regard in this case as a as a baggage, as baggage. So, don't cleave with baggage, leave baggage behind. Let's discuss a few baggage that we need to leave behind. One is um, past experiences, past experiences, past experiences. Things that we have witnessed. For instance, things you have witnessed observing a bad marriage. A woman walked up into my office while I pastored at Daystar Christian Center. This was um, about 17 years ago, and it was a few months into my, my wedding. Um, I was madly in love, and still, still madly in love with, with my bride. You know, and I sat in my office this fateful day, and I got a call from the reception. They said, um, somebody's here for counseling, and you're on duty today for counseling. I said, give me five minutes, I'll be ready. And by the time the woman walked in, uh, in the first three minutes, she was a wreck. She was, um, she was completely messed up, just crying. And you know, the first thing she told me was, a pastor, yesterday was our 10th wedding anniversary. And uh, the last time I saw my husband was two days ago. And it's in this city. It's yet to call. There was no marking of our anniversary. He has refused to come home. He's just doing his own thing. And I just feel really frustrated right now. And then she went on and on and told me about her experience in the last 10 years and all that. I was supposed to be counseling her, right? But I sat there thinking, ah, look at how much you have saved for this wedding. Look at all the preparation. Is this what you are going to Something just told me that I needed to reevaluate what I was about to do. Because this was somebody who came to tell me her stories of the last 10 years and what she was going through right now. Yeah. I had to pray internally, especially for the Holy Spirit to help me to be able to make sense. Because while she was talking, I was reevaluating my life. Yeah. So I was, I was in the fix. I didn't know whether to tell her, uh, let me go and pray and come back tomorrow because I don't know what to say, you know, and all that. Because it was just... It was just messing me up very badly. It was messing my mind up very badly. So I said all I had to say, prayed with her, encouraged her, connected her uh, to another senior colleague of mine who was not around there, but I know would be able to counsel her better. I just did a lot of prayer for her. And when she left, I put my head on my table like this. And for like the next 15, 20 minutes, I was just thinking, God, is this the way this thing is? And am I sure that I'm ready? Because I, I, don't, I don't want to have this story in 10 years. Yeah. I don't want to have this kind of story in 10 years. And thank God, I mean, 10 years came and passed many, many years now. And I didn't have a bad story to tell. So, past experiences, what we have observed from bad marriages, observed from the marriage of our parents, of loved ones, you know, all kinds of things may constitute some kind of baggage that you are carrying. How are you dealing with them so that they don't affect where you are going? Are you clarifying what you are hearing with the word of God? How far are you from the ideal? Another one is wrong ideologies. Wrong ideologies. So some people have the wrong understanding, for instance, of love and respect. Or a wrong understanding of the concept of submission in marriage. And then you go into marriage without properly clarifying what certain things mean. I mean, for instance, some people have remained in an abusive marriage or abusive relationship just because of the concept of submission. Yeah, submission. So a man goes out 
drinks himself into a stupor, comes back home, sits down, yells at you, says all kinds of unthinkable things to you, wakes you up at 1 a.m. and says, go and make a meal for me. And you finish cooking the meal and it's threatening to break a bottle on your head because it's completely drunk. And as he's saying, the Bible says we should submit. The Bible says we should submit. As your pastor, I'll say, by the next morning, you should call a meeting to say we can't live like this. Yeah, we can live like this. And if the man is not willing to listen to you, call family together. You call people together. Who will be able to look? Because if you have the wrong notion of, of submission in marriage, you may lose your life in the process. Yeah. You, they will celebrate you in heaven, but they will also tell you that you are a bit foolish. Because it was not the will of God for you to die young. It was just because you misunderstood. Yeah. For you to do everything without any form of complaint or trying to remediate the situation, it must be that the man was under the full control and full influence of God. Somebody cannot be under the full influence, put himself or herself under the full influence of the devil, and you are still submitting to the devil through the person. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. If you have a wrong notion of submission in marriage, <clears throat> somebody can, you can be a Christian and somebody brings charms into your house and say, come, come, come and take your own. And you say, ah, it's my wife or it's my husband or it's my husband especially and we need to submit. So where is submission making you to cross the boundary where the love of God cannot reach you? I don't have enough time this morning, but I know somebody's getting what I'm saying. I, said, I, I hope you're getting what I'm saying. So wrong ideologies, let me just pick one more and then I'll go to the next thing there. Another wrong ideology is the ideology that the man should provide everything for the home. It's a wrong ideology. Yeah. Yes, I, I want to sink in. Okay, listen to me right now. There's no way this will be preached anywhere in Africa that we won't have this kind of response. Yeah. Because I know it's still alien to us that the pastor will say that. Because somebody's saying now, do you know the Bible say that a man that cannot provide for his house is worse than an infidel? Where is that written in the Bible? First Timothy chapter 5, right? But you're quoting it wrongly. Yeah, you're quoting, put, put First Timothy 5 from verse 1 up there. Let me help them this morning. Oh, yeah, quick, quick, quick. First Timothy 5 from verse 1. Okay, so follow me carefully. Follow me carefully. He said, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him. This was Paul writing to his protege, Timothy, a young pastor. And he, he gave him instruction how to treat an older man, how to treat a younger, you know. He said, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity and all that. And then, uh, started talking about widows from verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows. That means that some people are not really widows. <laughs> <laughs> simple. It's very simple. All right. <laughs> and then verse 4 says, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Not all widows should come to church. Widows with children, grandchildren, he said, take, take care of them from home. Verse, verse 5. Now, she who is really a widow let, and left alone. Trust in God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. So these are the kind of widows that qualify for benevolence in church. Yeah. But, she, but, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Look at verse 7. All these things command that they may be blameless. Verse 8. But if anyone does not provide, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 9. Do not let widows under 60. Everything is written about here that is written about is about widow. Are you following me? That was a subject matter. It's about widow. Widow. Up till verse 11, 12, it was still talking about widow. Widow that is under 60, I'll be taken into the number, and, you know, and not unless she has been a wife of one man. We was just giving instructions about widows. Now, having said this, I'm not saying that men should not provide in their home. 
But you know the misconception. Yeah, the misconception that we have is that in a double income household, a woman can do anything she likes with her own money while the man must pay school fees, pay house rent, pay everything. And this is a double income household in 21st century Nigeria, Lagos. <laughs> do you know what, what is really happening here? This misconception made, has made a lot of single ladies go into marriage seeing themselves as the project of a man. If you present yourself as a project to a man, the man will treat you like a project. Like a furniture to be acquired. So when he adds you to his house, after a while, <laughs> if it's time to dispose the furniture, he will dispose the furniture. You understand? Or bring another furniture to join this one. But if we are partners in destiny, why will a man go into capital project and exclude you? Buy land, not put your name. Buy house, not put your name. Because he, you were just uh, something that he acquired, like he was acquiring the. But if you come into the marriage with a partnership mindset, I am not, as a lady, you need to be able to say, I'm not a man's project. I'm an helper of destiny. Who has a destiny to fulfill? Myself. I have a destiny to fulfill, and I'm there to help somebody else so that both of us will help ourselves to fulfill our destiny. I hope somebody's following me this morning. But this misconception that makes me feel like I'm a project in the hand of a man, that's why a man can be quarreling with his wife and say, you pack out of my house today. Whose house? It depends on how the woman has presented herself. If we came in as partners in progress, abroad, the man is the one that leaves. Yeah. <laughs> the, man will, if the man is angry, angry very well, right? Just pack your load and leave. Leave the house. But in Africa, they tell the woman to leave. Part of the reason why our men also accept this sometimes is that they want control. I should not pay all the bills in my home because I want control. I should pay all the bills in my home because I want to be responsible. And when I cannot afford, I have a helper of destiny. Yeah. That's it. I hope you are still with me this morning. It's very, very important that we have this at the back of our mind because these are some of the misconceptions creating problems. God is our source. In every home where you have two people who are gainfully employed, you have two channels that God wants to use. If our whole attention is focused on one channel, we are the one reducing how God can reach that home. That's what happens when a woman is expecting that I'm not supposed to be working. Or some men who wants to put a woman, incapacitate a woman, so that they can control her, say, don't bother to work, I'll pay all the bills. You should ask, why? <laughs> Me too, I want to pay small. So I want to go and work. Yeah, I want to do something with my life. I have a destiny to fulfill. Yeah. If I'm going to do it at all, maybe for a season, maybe because of the children. But you know, women carry gifts. Every calling. I mean, a woman can be super rich, super blessed. Some of the best CEOs in the world are women. Yesterday, my wife and I were speaking for Mrs. Alakija, who they said is, I mean, is the richest woman in Africa or something like that. Yeah, a woman. She's super rich. Who says you can't be that rich? I, I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying this morning, but when we start with the understanding that I'm not supposed to be responsible for anything, then we don't even push ourselves also. I'm talking about how a woman prepares for marriage, prepares to be a blessing, prepares to be a helper of destiny. Glory be to Jesus. If anybody doesn't understand what I'm saying, go home with it. Think about by tomorrow morning, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because a, a new idea takes about 48 hours to become a part of your system. Yeah, I understand. So, yeah, I understand. Don't bother asking me a question after the service. Just go and think about it first. <laughs> 
And then maybe before weekend, you can call me. We can. <laughs> By that time, I'm sure you'll be smiling at me. Because some people are still thinking, what is this pastor saying in this morning? Especially somebody who is here with somebody you are dating. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> I said, praise God. There are also unproductive behaviors, unfruitful habits that we need to leave behind. And I'm going to close or try to close with that. Unfruitful habits that we need to leave behind. One of the unfruitful habits that we need to leave behind is bad money habits, bad sexual habits. You know, all those things, we need to seek to leave them behind. You cannot be spending everything you earn right now as a single person and expect you're going to enter marriage like that and somebody will carry. There are people who have, I mean, I've counseled people in this church who got into marriage with indebtedness and it ruined the marriage. It pains me. I mean, I, I, I remember a particular couple right now that the reason, part of the reason why they are no longer together today is because of series of indebtedness that they came into the marriage with. Yeah. You cannot live your life anyhow and enter marriage anyhow. If, as I'm speaking to you now, you are indebted, make up your mind. Before I get into a marriage, I want to clear my debt. I don't want to be a liability in a marriage. I want to be an asset. Are you still with me today? Yeah? If you, if you borrow to buy something and you are, it's stressing you out and you, your, your wedding is in view and all that, go and sell it. Yeah. Go and sell it. Relieve yourself of that body. Two. One will chase a thousand. Two, ten thousand. There is providential help already embedded into the married life. If you come in with every baggage that will slow the grace of God down, you may not be able to maximize it. Yeah. And then you start to say that, oh, maybe God is not faithful. No. So bad money habits, it's not good. You need to deal with it before you get into marriage. Also, like I said, uh, the issue of sex. If you're here, you're preparing to get married, and you're still very sexually active, you're not helping yourself. I need to say to you the way it is. You are not helping yourself at all. At all. Living and cleaving is like using super glue. I described it in second service last week. When you read the direction, if you want to use super glue to put two things together, one of it is that they said uh, that you should, this work will work better if you are joining two materials of the same type. That's one. Two is that he said, clean the surface of the two of them very well. Some of us have read it before, right? And then apply the glue on both surfaces. Allow it to seep in into the materials. And then put the two of them together, applying certain level of pressure. Sustain that pressure for a few minutes before you let go. You get the best result at cleaving. So what am I saying? I cannot be sleeping around now and expect that with my dirty self, I get joined to somebody else and we'll just join. Yeah. It won't happen. It won't happen. Especially when both people are also sleeping around, you know. Or if we have allowed ourselves to be sleeping with ourselves. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 6 the Bible says, in uh, is it verse, um, let's check verse 15 or so. It said, do you not know, yeah, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them member of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined with a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he said, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So he said this sin is in a different category. That's what Paul said. You know, you can lie. It's bad, it's bad to lie. But he said it's different from when you are committing sexual immorality. A sin against the body. He said, or oh, do you not know that your body is a temple of God? 
the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price, verse 20 says. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, God's property. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the <clears throat> funny things we do as singles is that we want to eat our cake and have it. And when we preach this kind of message, some people leave service thinking, you know, those pastors are old school, you know. How can somebody survive in these days? Two people who like themselves and have chemistry. They will not be dating for one year. They won't do anything. Yeah. Dating or courtship relationships is an opportunity for you to learn self-control. Yeah. To learn self-control. What does it take to break the power of my will as a Christian to sleep with a lady that I'm in courtship with? It takes a bit if I'm truly born again. I have to work on myself to do that. It's the same thing that it would take to do it if I'm on a business trip after I've gotten married and my wife is not there and part of the entertainment is ladies. Yeah, a friend of mine went, <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine went, went on a trip, went on a trip to China once and, um, you know, executives and then they give them all the list of activities and part of the activity is also that babes are available. So he called me from there. So hey, PG, I saw the list of activities. <laughs> and I just wanted to tell you ahead of time that there's one that I cannot handle. So you should be praying for me <laughs> and be calling me <laughs> so that my faith will not fail. Yeah. It's, it's the same. If, let, let me, my time is finished. Can I tell you the truth? If you cannot practice celibacy for just six months before you get married, there's no guarantee that you will not cheat in marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Quote me anywhere. I will defend myself. Quote me on Twitter. I will defend myself. I said, quote me anywhere. I will defend myself. Yeah. These are not things that we say in the back side of anywhere. No. I'm saying it too. I'm speaking to my church, but anyone that cares to listen in the world should listen. For you to sustain a marriage, you know what, what Jesus said? I mean, what the scripture says, husband, Ephesians 5, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. That means he died for her. If I cannot die to my sexual proclivities, I will make a woman miserable because I will lack self-control. It's the same thing. If I cannot die for the sake of the person I want to marry and for the sake of ourselves, if we cannot die to our sexual proclivities for a period of time to demonstrate that I can sacrifice my life, my, my, you know, my cravings just to be the right person in this home or trust worthy help me. Who will not cheat, whether emotionally, financially, or as the case may be. That's what we're talking about today. And it takes some bit of practice and preparation before you get into it. It's time to leave parents behind, family, to leave ex, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend behind, to leave foolish friends behind. Yeah. To leave controlling influences behind. Time to leave controlling influences behind. And it's time to, to leave the influence of benefactors. Any man that you are dating that is still telling you, I need to speak to my uncle to see if he can pay for the, for, give me money for my rent or pay for the all that we'll use for wedding. I mean, if your parents decide to pay for it, they're doing it in love, but if you have to and beg a family member to pay, that's a problem. Because the day that person says, I'm coming to your house, and I want both of you to sit down, I paid for your hall, sit down. <laughs> you cannot say, uncle, you can't come, or we're not available. It will say, if I curse you. <laughs> Especially in Africa, here, yeah. Because my money is in the foundation of what you are doing. See, <laughs> we need to put all those things behind us. Both of us should be able to sit down and prepare for what we want to do 
because God is interested in taking you and I to the next level. Lift your hand to Jesus today and just bless him. Just bless him, bless him. Father, we thank you. And in the name of Jesus, I speak grace over everyone under the influence of my voice today. I declare that the hand of God comes upon you to lift you from anything holding you down. In the name of the Lord Jesus, my God lifts you, frees you to engage with a fruitful future. In the name of the Lord Jesus, whatever is making anyone to stagnate and to be left behind, to stay on the same spot, not being able to leave that emotional baggage, not being able to leave you know, that, that, that financial baggage to be able to get into what God has in mind for you. I stand against it today and I decree, decree and declare that it's your season of freedom. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus. I speak healing over somebody's emotions here. I speak peace over someone's heart here. I decree this morning that my God is healing your heart so that you can forget the pain of the past. In the name of the Lord Jesus. My God is bringing you into a new season. New beginnings. He said, remember not the former things or the things of old because I will do a new thing. I declare a season of new things in your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I said in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wave your hands to Jesus all over this place and bless him.